Hi, my name is Stephanie. Thank you for joining us today for Create an Amazon-like IT Service Management Experience. A few quick notes before we start. Your phone lines are muted today, so if you have any questions, please use the Q&A panel. To access the Q&A panel, go to the top right-hand corner of your browser. You'll see a blue square with a question mark. Please send your questions to all panelists. That way I can view them and get them allocated to the correct speaker. Also, to go to full screen mode, the uh, best way to do this is the double arrows just above and to the right of the evergreen slide you currently see in the viewing window. These double arrows will bring you to full screen, which you'll find helpful later when Jeff does his demonstration. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to Don Kasson, CEO of Evergreen Systems. Don? Thank you, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Don Kasson, CEO of Evergreen, and with me is my normal partner in crime, Jeff Benedict, who heads up our ITS in practice as well as our innovation efforts. If you're new to our webinar series, welcome. If you're a past attendee, thanks for showing up again. Our goal is to share valuable information and insights you can use in your planning and activities right now. The topic we will explore today is create an Amazon-like IT service management experience. I'm jazzed about this topic for two reasons. One, Amazon is truly the master of the complete customer experience. And two, we can creatively borrow from them. So here's our agenda. You see it up top. After a very little bit about Evergreen, we'll dive into our topic. And beyond that, we will briefly demonstrate some of the concepts we discussed today in our always evolving view of a very advanced self-service catalog and portal experience, which is built on ServiceNow. Then we'll answer uh, some questions if you have any. Evergreen is a US-based consulting firm. We've worked with hundreds of mid-market, Fortune 1000, and public sector organizations to improve their IT service management execution. We're a full life cycle firm, or in the words of one customer, we have both process and technology in the same company. We are one of the top five US ServiceNow partners and have over a decade of domain experience in each of, their, each of the areas of the ServiceNow portfolio. But we view all of this from a perspective of what we call customer-centric IT service management. At Evergreen, we think that traditional ITSM thinking is just plain wrong because it puts the customer, the people we're really doing this for, last. It's hard to believe but true. In most cases, it takes us a couple of years to really even think about the customer. You say, well, you know, that sounds crazy. How could that possibly happen? And it's not that hard when you look at it. First off, we have walls around our thinking that we don't even see. This is how it's always been done, so we don't challenge it. Secondly, we don't know how to put the customer first. What does the customer want? What are the best practices? How do we build it? So we kind of put it out there in phase three. Third, we do know traditional incident change problem and a little bit of knowledge, best practices really well. So that's what we do, what we're comfortable with. Unfortunately, it is wrong. We think we need to start with the customer. The customer should get a very big win in phase one. Both the technology and the best practices can support that today. Best of all, if we start with a customer, it will actually change what we do. Now here's a couple of quick examples. An incident, rather than thinking about how to handle incidents, perhaps we'll focus instead on how to eliminate or prevent the customer from having to contact us in the first place. In change, rather than always thinking about managing change, maybe we'll think about how to eliminate or streamline change to minimize impact and speed for the customer that gets what they need. And in knowledge management, maybe that becomes search, learn, and share, right? A place for powerful social self-enablement rather than just, in most cases, what's really a tired afterthought. So our, our belief is, hey, start with the customer and it changes what you do. So into our topic today. As I said, Amazon is the big Mac daddy of the customer-centric experience. They are very big, a $203 billion market value. To put that in perspective, Apple has a $740 billion market value, a little over three times, and they are the most valuable company in US history. But here's really what's most interesting to us. 30% of people out there research products on Amazon above anything else, more than people research on Google. And you may, you may not know this, but Amazon Prime, the free two-day shipping that started out at $69 a year, was a very big gamble. 
Amazon believed customers hated paying shipping costs even more than it was actually worth, but they didn't know how much. They needed customers to buy more in order to make the gamble pay. They never imagined we would buy four times as much. This is a really great example of rethinking your business from the customer's perspective. What is really important to the customer may not even be that hard for you to do. So I can only speak to myself. I shop a lot on Amazon Prime, and here's why. The product research due to social media reviews is unparalleled. I know if I see a product with four and a half stars and 50 or more reviews, I know it's going to be excellent. That is really valuable to me. I have broad enough choices, and I can very easily narrow them down. The price, while not the lowest, is generally fair, and the incredible convenience and ease of use puts it, the whole experience over the top. So they have mastered, in my eyes, the complete customer experience. You know, as we studied Amazon, which we did, as well as other excellent examples in this same arena like Apple and Zappos, we, we sort of teased out five principles we saw at work. They are simple, beautiful, complete, predictive, and leading. So let's take a little bit deeper look at those. Simple means just that, simple, not hard to understand or do, having few parts, not complex or fancy. This is how people shop on Amazon. They type in what they're looking for and go from there. While any given screen or the entire service end-to-end -end may have a lot of details, simple means eliminating every word, button, graphic, or item of any sort that is not totally and directly related to the customer's needs and understanding, choosing, and using the service. Then the customer will see it as simple. Here's some key advice and kind of a classic problem we have in IT. Don't make the customer do our work. That's what we do. Why ask the customer to provide, provide information that we can glean without asking them? It may take a little more work on our part, but that is what is required. If, someone is, if a customer is buying software and we can discover and match their platform automatically you know, with that software for compatibility purposes, then let's not ask them to identify their PC and self-determine if the software works on it. Principle two is beautiful. Now, beauty is the quality in a thing that gives pleasure to the senses, mind, or spirit. While graphic fonts and details are beautiful on Amazon, it's, more, it's much more than that. Uh, try thinking of beautiful as a function rather than as an adjective. Since there is no universal definition of beauty, how can we possibly please everyone? We can't. So while we strive to make every step and screen beautiful by following our principles, the higher order goal is to make the experience beautiful. Complete is having all the necessary parts, not lacking or limited in any way, not requiring more work, entirely done. That's, a, that's the definition. Everything the customer needs to understand, choose, and use the service is there. Arranged to facilitate their decision-making process. Building a complete experience for a service means two things. First, for every given page or every place you stop, the experience is complete. Everything you need to decide on or use, the service is right there. It's been completely thought out from the customer's perspective. Two, for, for every step from start to finish, the experience is complete end to end. To be successful, every service experience must be engineered to be complete end to end. Predictive is to foretell based on observation or experience. And this is something that, that Amazon really excels at. Predictive goes hand in hand with complete. It takes it one step further, introducing possibilities the customer is likely to want, along with the ability to easily explore them. Predictive is always that little surprise that pleases the customer. I'm a stereo guy. Here I'm shopping for a Bluetooth adapter. Right, which allows me to connect lots of things to old stereo gear. I like the Logitech one, so Amazon is being predictive, and they're showing me some cables I will probably need, and then they're showing me what other customers bought along with the adapter. That's smart. Leading is to guide something or someone along the way. 
Leading is ensuring you're linking each step on the service path to the next for the complete service end to end. Here are the steps Amazon is leading me through. After understanding the item has the functionality I want, I can then go to reviews and see if it is the quality I like. And I can go to the frequently asked questions to answer any further concerns I might have, like does this work with my stereo system? Once I place the item in the shopping cart and click buy, only then do I need to sign in. Pretty smart ordering of what they are asking me to do. You know, they could ask me right up front, but if I'm just browsing, that's going to be an inconvenience. So they think about these steps as they go. Then, after that, I can quickly choose shipping, gift, and payment options to go from cart to purchase as easily as possible and quickly as possible. That's good for them, and it's good for me. Beyond that, it's also about taking the customer somewhere you want them to go, like maybe signing up for the company's new BYOD support offering, assuming you make it worth their while, right? or a new single sign-on capability, which could be better for them and better for IT. We use the five principles, simple, beautiful, complete, predictive, and leading every day in the work we do with our clients. Now let's take a look at what we call the three constituents of a service. It's not just the customers. We have three constituencies, the customer, the providers, and the managers. All must be involved and have their needs met to create any truly viable service. The customer wants an excellent customer experience, and to deliver that, we must think like the customer and design from the customer in, not IT out, or the customers will reject it. The provider wants execution effectiveness, and if we don't build in a way that makes them more efficient and effective, they won't support the change with the customers and will work around the system. The manager wants governance and accountability, and without these, we cannot price and deliver a service consistently with high quality. For customer-centric, what is most critical is always designed from the customer in rather than IT out. And this is really the highest value principle because it's the Achilles heel of a, of a service. If the customer won't use it, we're done. As you begin creating services, it's also critical that you add some forward-thinking customers as full participants to your service design team. I know for a lot of us in IT, that seems like an unnatural act, and it feels like it will be inefficient and take too long. You know, and since we're always in a hurry in IT, but forward-thinking customers will keep you aligned against value, make you more efficient, and serve as proponents with other customers as you make progress. A complete service experience is end-to-end, -end, as we said, start to finish, with consistently high quality. If not, the customers reject it. A big key to success in building complete service experiences is the interplay between the providers and the customers every step of the way. There's no way it can just be good for one or the other. Both have to benefit. As mentioned, the provider is looking for this execution effectiveness. They can get this by simplifying and automating high volume repetitive tasks. They can also get it by creating what we call happy meals for customers. Right? And a happy meal is a number or it is an example of a package service. And we want to create a number of these package services that meet the majority of the need, the 80-20 or the 70-30, and can be, delivered, can be delivered very efficiently, maybe even highly automated. If we go to the grassroots levels with our providers and really simplify and improve how the work gets done, then they will love it too and will lead customers to the new way of doing business. And that really gets us over the biggest challenge of this whole thing which is change resistance. Any end-to-end -end service must be accountable. Amazon Prime is two days delivery guaranteed, and the customer doesn't care how it gets done, just that it does get done. Without visibility into quality and accountability, we are flying blind. I don't care if you call it SLAs, OLAs, delivery expectations, or KPIs. Every service requires a delivery expectation and then you have to beat it. The key is not how fast you can do it, but how reliably you can do it. If you know you can provision a, de a new desktop in two weeks, at the worst case, then promise three. The customer can then set their expectations correctly at the point when they make the decision, so when it arrives in two weeks, they're pleasantly surprised. While this sounds simple, it can be especially hard for services that touch multiple IT silos. 
with teams that may not be used to specific accountability in that way. But you cannot avoid it or you won't deliver a complete service experience. So start conservatively the targets you know you can meet, then share them on a regular basis with the end-to-end -end team that delivers the service. They will naturally begin to find ways to simplify and speed up the process. It's a well-established principle of human nature. They're all trying to do a good job. This happens. Okay, so now let's take a look at a four-step process for building your own Amazon-like customer experience. Step one is building a beautiful customer service portal. Start with improving the customer's IT experience. Your initial self-service portal and catalog can be operational in a month or less. For many, just an easier way to make and track the status of IT requests and search knowledge, even a little bit, is a huge win. Even if there aren't any pre-built services in the first release. And I know we have a number of clients, this was their first big win. As long as customers know you are listening and improving incrementally, they can be very patient. So step two is building a basic service taxonomy. As you begin to think about the kinds of services you might want to offer and how you offer them, it is logical to think about how you might organize and manage your services consistently. Key to this is step two, building a good basic service taxonomy. We have tried to do this in spreadsheets, but we found it was impossible to visualize and modify them effectively with a group. And a taxonomy exercise is, is essentially always a group exercise. So we built our taxonomy models in an easy to use, simple and inexpensive mind mapping technology called XMind. Here you see a high level view, two categories of IT services, customer facing and internal, as well as shared services and line of business services. We'll look a little bit deeper here. And as mentioned, we break IT services into two groups, customer facing and internal IT. Now you don't have to follow this convention, but these are often mixed together, which really confuses everyone. Here you also see one of our service taxonomy principles that we proved out through trial and error, that the taxonomy labels are for the customer and the framework is for the providers. Any section of a taxonomy is targeted at a particular customer set or consumer. And since we want to think like the customer, then the labels in that section should be in the customer's language, not in the provider's. What do, we, what do we mean, though, when we say the framework is for the providers? Well, the framework is the way the providers can understand the breadth and depth of services and combinations of services offered. If you have 300 services, could you really understand a numbered or alphabetic list of them? It would be too hard. So the framework is for the providers to help understand the services and combinations offered logically to avoid creating redundant services, to better combine existing services, and to ensure that services are aligned with the right customer. Not to forget Amazon. Here's a a, really a small subset of their huge taxonomy. And you can open their taxonomy right from their, uh, right from their homepage if you want to see it, which I guess this is appropriate for the Earth's biggest selection, which is what they call this. If we look under Home, Garden, and Tools, which is that, let's see, it's this category right here, we see a subcategory, right, which we call Patio, Lawn, and Garden, and then that opens another level in the taxonomy, which includes generators, grilling, and patio furniture, to name a few. So you can see it more or less follows the same process we're talking about. Step three is piloting some key services. This is, really, this is really important to think about right here. We find that IT in general has a lot to learn about designing and delivering customer-centric services because we really have never done it before. We found the best way to learn is iteratively in small steps. This can be accomplished by building three to five example services that are good candidates. Often, you know, good targets are things that are low complexity and high volume. And during this process, everyone learns a lot. Along with that, it's not unusual for the owners and staff in any given silo area of IT to feel a bit protective about what they consider to be their services. This can be a combination of maybe a concern for job security as well as the desire to control in order to ensure quality outcomes for their customers. The truth is, 
that while a silo may have specific services they do deliver, more often than not, they are part of a larger combined service offered to the customer. As a result, no one group in IT owns the customer. We all do together. Using a pilot rather than production approach is, is really magical in lowering the perceived risk, right? And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean it's permanent. Hey, it's only a pilot. We say that a lot when we're working with a client. And opening minds to working better together. So the last step, step four, is building a service factory. This is a service portfolio. We call it a service factory because it's a little bit easier for people to sort of understand what that means. And it really is essentially a factory. So when we have a handful of services, they can be built and maintained individually. But what about when we have hundreds? We then need a consistent production-like approach. We need a services factory, which we use to manage services over their useful lives. Let's take a, a quick look at the flow of work in this kind of a factory. At the front end, we have consider, which is our demand or intake funnel. If you're successful in getting this going in your business, it's quite possible you're going to get more requests for new services than you can deliver. Which are most important? Which have the greatest value to the company? How do we communicate this fairly to the customers asking for new services? That's what we have to think about in that demand funnel. Next comes build, where we construct service. Though it sounds strange, our goal should be not to build a service rather than build one. The more unique services we have for more and different customers, the more complex our service catalog becomes. We want to follow a building block philosophy in constructing services Start by creating a family of simple services which can be reused across IT. Manage more simply and combine like building blocks to better create other services. So there's a little bit of forethought that goes into this build phase. Then comes modify, which is what's happening to that service over its useful life. We're updating or making changes. That's fairly straightforward. What's important here is we should be asking the same questions we're asking in build and making sure that modifications go through a quality assurance and change control process to validate that we don't break existing functionality people are relying upon. Managing service building blocks as configuration items is a good services best practice. Last step is retire, where the service no longer has value and is removed from our active service catalog. An example of this for some might be a pager provisioning service. Perhaps you don't need the service anymore, now here's what's interesting to note. While the service may be retired, it may also be made up of a number of services building blocks that are actively in use across the enterprise. It's only this unique combination of these building blocks that is being retired. It is worthwhile to review your services on a regular planned basis, as having a lot of old, not very relevant services makes your catalog harder to navigate, and it makes it look out of date or not keeping up with the times in your customer's eyes. Okay, so that was a lot to cover in, in, uh, in presentation today, but we're through it. Uh, I will now turn it over to Jeff, and he can demo some of the concepts we have covered today. So while I'm handing the control over to Jeff, I'd like to remind everyone, uh, especially those of you who joined a bit later, that to view the presentation in full screen mode, you can use the double arrows located just above and to the right of the uh, presentation window. The double arrows or the plus sign will help you to go full screen. This will help a lot when Jeff starts his demo. Also, this is being recorded, so you will receive a recording link and a link to download the slides. Lastly, for your questions, please use the Q&A panel. Look, you can access that from the top right-hand corner, the Q&A button, and please send your questions to all panelists. Thanks, I'll turn it over to Jeff. All right, thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Don. So let me start with, um, I'm going to show you a real example. And this is from a ServiceNow uh, customer of ours. And this is a, you know, form, basically a screenshot of a, of a form that uh, they present to their customers to request training. And one thing I want to highlight with is if you scroll down this form, you'll see there's quite a bit of input that uh, is being asked of this individual user. Um, and so, you know, as a consumer or a customer, when I see this form, you know, my first reaction is that I get overwhelmed and I would likely give up on this request and, and probably seek alternative ways to uh, to submit this request, you know, whether that be, you know, kind of phone a friend or some other lifeline. 
Um, and we see this quite a bit where the interface to the customer is really focused on more the needs of the fulfillers, making sure we get all the information we need to fulfill the request rather than those needs of those consumers. Um, so we want to make, you know, kind of think of this differently, right? Think of this from the perspective of the customer and what are their needs and how can they, how can we best fulfill their, their requests and their needs. So going into ServiceNow, I'm going to start with, you know, this is a look at a self-service portal built that we built on uh, the content management system of ServiceNow. And, and it leverages kind of a metro style layout look and feel, which, you know, the style can certainly change, and I'll highlight this in a moment when we get further on. Um, but some of the things you'll see here, first of all, I do get kind of a dashboard kind of element here where I can see my activities and some of the counts via badges uh, to help me understand kind of where the activity is going on within the organization in, in context to me. Um, I can also see more information about certain types of requestable things with additional information that's revealed on Hover. Um, and another thing you'll see here, this, there's only a couple articles here posted to me, but the, the concept is here in terms of presenting different news and scrolling announcements to the consumer that would be contextually relevant to them and, and their job function. Another common need in these portals this, this day and age is for it to be responsive, to work on iPhones, on tablets. Um, so some of the experience you would see here is that you know, as I'm in an iPhone width, it, it adjusts its, its container and its presentation to that width. Also, my menu uh, is what's considered off canvas, so I can interact with that, you know, in, in my typical normal behavior that I would do a lot of apps on my, on my phone. Um, and also, as you'd expect, I can buy onto swipe events, so I can swipe right or swipe left to interact with that menu and, and navigate throughout the various portal to request my goods and services. You know, one of the first, you know, you think about Amazon, <clears throat> the site oftentimes starts with uh, kind of searching for goods. And so um, that's obviously kind of one of the places we expect many of our users to, to, to go into as a starting point uh, in these particular portals. So in this case, I'm looking for something, in this case, related to email. Um, and I can, through this search mechanism, I can go through the various sources inside of ServiceNow across knowledge, across business service definitions, across uh, things that I can request and order, and show various items within those different buckets. Further, I could extend that and add users, locations, or other data sources that may make sense to, uh, to present uh, to our consumers to f help find the information. The way this works is that they can then filter these by various kind of filter selections. Uh, I can look for software in different categories here. I can also mix and match my knowledge articles and ultimately find the article, the things I'm looking for. Um, notice I can also turn on and off different uh, just overall sources, and it's only focusing on those things that I want to request. Um, also notable here is um, you know, a common activity that sites like Amazon employ is uh, tracking your behavior. So they track things you view, they track things you order, um, or in this context, we're also tracking the searches that I perform so I can recall um, a previous search such as password and I can come back to those results and interact with something that I've, I've recently searched or that I commonly search for um, and use this as a way to kind of template and find uh, things that, I, I, that are personal to what my needs are. The other route to, uh, you know, shop and request, and, you know, we think of probably one of the first things we think of with Amazon is shopping or requesting things and buying things from, from the store. Um, and so, obviously, we can go the search route to find what we're looking for, but we can also kind of browse through the different categories. So that's what's presented here in terms of a, a visual of taxonomy. So, for example, I can drill into, say, uh, the hardware category. Maybe I want to look for a new tablet. I can find my you know, iPad that I want to get. And as you'd expect, I can add that to my cart. Or I could add it to my cart if I was to fill my shopping method, or I can add maybe I don't want to that's something I have to pay for. Maybe I want to add a desktop instead to my cart, and I can add that kind of through this mechanism. All right, and I can continue shopping, check out. Order now would be the equivalent of that one-click one action within Amazon, um, and I can add multiple items to my cart, and I can ultimately uh, proceed to check out, which I can access from there, or I can access from my, I could leave and come back to this and come back to my cart at a later date, and ultimately place my order. And upon kind of order uh, specification, I'm thrown into my status page to kind of track the status. So here you're kind of seeing your you know, FedEx stages of how is this progressing. Um, I'm also setting expectations with our consumers as to when can they expect this. Um, another you know, uh, friendly thing that Amazon does in terms of 
of setting uh, expectations of when you can actually expect it to hit your doorstep. Um, another element you'll see out here that we are doing is we're pushing messages to the consumer. So any notifications or alerts that are relevant to me, um, I can see kind of through this messages area. So in this case, this is a receipt of a, of a new order I've placed, but if there were an update to the stage or its progression, or if the delivery date were to, to change, um, that could be communicated to me through this mechanism, um, as well as any other broadcast alerts, outages, service issues, uh, can be pushed to me through this kind of uh, notifications and alert area of, of the portal. I'm gonna look at another request example, um, go into business solutions here. So let's go request access to salesforce.com. <clears throat> and you know, one of the first things that's happening here is that you'll see there's a reference to, this is part of a related service of salesforce.com services. So some of the information that I can see when I click on more information about salesforce.com is I'm providing some transparency to the consumer as to what they can expect from this particular service. So they can see what's in scope, what's out of scope. They can also see kind of what's the health um, and, and, and current status of this particular service. Further, I can, I can look at reviews and other feedback from other service consumers uh, to see whether this is something I really uh, you know, want to intake or, or, or need or what are my, the challenges I may encounter in interacting with this particular service. Let me go ahead and order this. So note also, if you look at this, I have um, some expectation setting, um, setting some expectations in terms of what's the cost going to be, in this case, 30 US dollars per month. Also, when can I expect to get uh, my access to this, this service uh, granted and provisioned? Um, and that's gonna happen with a max time of eight hours. So when I order this, let's say I need to communicate with customers. So I'll place my order. And this particular request is, is, is special in that the fulfillment plan for this has no user involvement whatsoever. Um, and only if there were issues with the automatic provisioning of my access would I uh, be, be, would tasks be doled out to groups and individuals to set up my access uh, in a more manual fashion. Otherwise, um, all the work's gonna happen through an orchestrated and automated means. Um, so see there's a, a setting here in terms of when can I expect this to be done. And also I can sit here and basically track as this thing progresses. So I can actually see now that we, since, we're, since we started this, it went through all the steps of creating an account for me, provisioning rights through Active Directory, uh, validating my access, delivering my account information via email to me, as well as noting that it is complete. Now if I want to see this in more of a workflow editor perspective, I can open this up. And I can see that it went through all the various stages of, of interacting with one, our identity management subservice, which actually provisioned our account into our identity management system. There are tasks in here to uh, reach out to Active Directory and provision my rights to different groups. And then there are other tasks out here to check and validate that my account is indeed set up appropriately. The end result is that now I have, uh, notice a link here that says I'm now a subscriber of this service. So if I click here to use this service, I'm now launching through our identity management system and into salesforce.com as a new logged in user and my profile and role has been attached to this. So I'm able to actually get out to here and start using this service uh, interactively. Now on the other end of this service, and I just want to note that as Don indicated, there's three constituents of the service. You got the requester, the provider, and, and the management. Um, so there is a, a perspective here for the uh, kind of service owner or service provider through the portal. So I'm gonna, I'm just toggling over here to the, um, the user who's logged in as the service owner of the salesforce.com service. So they can come out and for example, they can go to the services I own I can see salesforce.com as the service that I own. And some of my options here is I can go and edit my service or I can also look at my kind of service management dashboard. Now, the, the notables that are listed here, first of all, there's a, a kind of a notice to me as the, as the service owner that we now have a new subscriber to our service. So that was me going through that request access and being provisioned. So I see that here. I also see it up here in my messages and alerts. Um, if I open up my subscribers, I'll also see that Jeff is now listed here as a subscriber. But some of the other notables that, uh, that we'll see on this page, first of all, 
So the information on the right here is really kind of probably the most critical component for the service owner. These are the commitments that we have agreed to as part of this service. Um, one here being related to how quickly we're going to resolve priority one is issues related to the service. Um, also our requirements around access requests, uh, being those delivered within eight hours or less, um, as well as the availability of the service, which, you know, in the case of a SaaS-based application, obviously some of that is, is on our, our vendor, but there's also the components like our identity management system or other, the other components that are uh, essential to the application that uh, we also need to ensure are available and, and, and working to ensure this overall service is meeting our customers' uh, availability needs. So the other thing the service owner can do from here, they can obviously look at various graphs and charts that are relevant to their service, but they can also drill into looking at what are the active incidents and whether or not they're in a breach or near breach kind of state. Same with requests. They can see that all of these have been satisfied within time. Um, and lastly, they can look at the various subscriber feedback and some of that qualitative information that we're getting back in context of our service and what our rating is. Now, one thing I want to highlight here under subscribers, <clears throat> there's a little bullhorn kind of next to each of these uh, subscribers. And what this does is it allows the service uh, owner to basically request uh, some feedback of a given uh, subscriber to, to, in essence, populate some of this feedback information. So my new service subscriber, maybe it's been enough time and he's got acquainted with our service that I want to kind of facilitate or, or reach out and get information back from this service subscriber. So I'm going to hit this button and say, yes, I do want feedback from, from Jeff. So in essence, there's a queued up activity now for Jeff to provide that service feedback. Toggling back, if I go back to my portal here, my, my surveys, and I've also got a notification in context of this as well, but now has a new item out here for provide service feedback in context to salesforce.com with a due date of when I expect this back. If I can come out here, I can say you know, service It's great so far, got access super quickly. Boom, fills out the feedback. And now we've gotten, in essence, using the portal as a vehicle to communicate and retrieve that feedback. If I refresh over here, I should now see that Jeff has provided some feedback. I also see it in my now recent service feedback over here with a four rating, and obviously would adjust my average rating accordingly based off of that as well. All right, so the other, um, <clears throat> You know, now that I'm a service consumer of this Salesforce.com service, I might have questions, I might have issues pertaining to using the service. So one of the avenues I can go to in here is I can go to this Get Help. Um, and some of my options in getting help uh, in, in support of services, first of all, I can go through and look through kind of the common, what's popular uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the context of service questions and service answers. And so some of the things I see here, what are the common things that people are asking to in terms of getting set up with uh, their voicemail or getting their software or getting tablets, as well as those trending and popular uh, frequently asked questions and answers to those frequently asked questions. Um, another angle I can go is to ask the community. So we can leverage things like live feed inside of ServiceNow, or you could use Jive or Yammer or some other collaborative tools to um, kind of, in essence, broker or allow, uh, I guess, broker community-based uh, feedback and support to help collaborate and provide guidance and support on, on, uh, on a given service. The last area, this Contact Us, is a little more of a scripted way of getting support. So I can come in here and choose salesforce.com, for example, and then I'm presented with um, some topics that are contextually relevant to this service. So maybe I'm having questions around my access, and the first thing it's going to do is kind of suggest some knowledge articles that may assist me in self-solving my particular um, questions related to Salesforce.com access. And if I still need help, then I can launch out here and, and kind of go through different channels of communication or engagement to, to get that support that I need. Um, and this is, this is topic-centric, so depending on the topic that's out there, I might not have chat available, I might not have uh, a live feed group specific to it, but in this case, this is a, a, a situation where a service does have um, an available chat, so I can maybe choose to chat specifically with a salesforce.com expert to help me with my questions, or I could go through an appointment basis, which is 
would be similar to get that one-on-one -on -one consultation, but more in a uh, genius bar kind of model where I'm scheduling uh, within the available windows of time an appointment that I can get that one-on-one -on -one consultative advice and support. Um, also, as I said before, there you could have contextually relevant uh, topical live feed groups. So in this case, I can have a group specific to salesforce.com where I can share information related to that, uh, that product or service offering um, and get answers from my community rather than, um, than just through a knowledge base or from the support experts themselves. And lastly, I can go submit a help request to kind of uh, traditionally submit uh, a ticket and, and, uh, and get some answers back related to my questions or issues that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm seeing. Kind of one, like I said, you know, I've been focused on this Metro style portal. One thing I want to highlight um, in terms of just, actually, I think I have it out there already. Uh, let me close some of these windows. Is, you know, you certainly can present these content management systems and portals um, in very different looks and feels. And certainly we, for the customers we work with, we look to brand the experience so that it's common to the consumers so they can move from other sites they use to, to these portals in a fluid and, uh, and easy manner. And you know, this particular portal solution uh, you know, is an example uh, of kind of highlighting some of the things that Amazon does as well. So you'll see, first of all, this is a, probably a little more prominent of a search. Um, so in essence, pushing or steering the user towards doing a search first kind of base solution. Um, another notable aspect is a lot of information this user can consume from this initial page. So I can quickly see information that's uh, suggestions to me, or I can quickly browse through our service taxonomy. I can also look at my status of tickets strictly from this page, as well as any of those alerts and outages and notifications I can see from this, uh, from this main page. You know, much of the spirit of what Amazon does is that they leverage your preferences, you know, they leverage your account information as well as your uh, kind of behavior to make suggestions. So you'll see here um, some items that are suggested to me based off of my kind of position and what other people within uh, similar positions use or leverage within their, within their support function. Um, the other things I see down here are my activity-based information, things that I order regularly and commonly um, I, or kind of push to the top as well as the things that I'm commonly or recently viewing as well as my recent searches. So I have a way to quickly jump to that. Um, I can if this is information that's not uh, applicable or all that relevant to me, um, I can also hide this and just kind of ignore those suggestions and jump quickly to those things that are uh, common requests or common engagement channels of support. So that uh, concludes what I hope to show today. I do uh, thank you for time and I hope this was helpful in seeing, first of all, how ServiceNow can you know, deliver a customer-centric experience and hit on some of those uh, notable features that Amazon employs. Okay, thanks, Jeff. It, uh, let's see, okay. For next steps, if you found this at all interesting and you wonder what might be a logical next step, here are a couple of different options. Uh, if you're interested in our advanced self-service catalog and portal, the functionality, it is available as a self-service demo, uh, fully functional. You can get your own login, just follow the links on our website, and then you can, uh, you can experiment with it to your heart's content. You can place orders, you can uh, put in requests, you can check status, you can search, you can do everything that, uh, that Jeff was doing from a user interface standpoint. If you're looking for a better, easier way to organize and categorize services, then you can take a, a look at a short demo we have of our service taxonomy mind map application on our website, and it really, uh, it really makes it so much easier to understand and manage the service infrastructure. Or if you are considering a broader service catalog initiative but aren't sure where to start, uh, what we have found to be very popular and, and work very well is a one-day private workshop, which we hold on your site for up to 15, employ uh, 15 attendees. And it's designed to educate your team, uncover the key business drivers and roadblocks, create a common language and direction, and to get your team on the same page. And we go through the service design process, we go through the functions of the service catalog, we go through a taxonomy exercise. It's a pretty deep day. And you learn a lot in that day, it gets everybody on the same page, and it can save months of effort in building consensus and understanding to get your program moving. So we, we, we think it's a very nice value at about $4,000, which includes the travel costs. So uh, that's, that's all we have to talk about today. 
let's open it up for uh, questions if we have any. And, and we do have some questions. And Jeff, I'm going to start with the ones for you while your demo is fresh in people's minds. I, I got one uh, in relatively early in your demo, a question asking, are the software development projects, for example, green free, greenfield, brownfield projects, et cetera, part of the solution? And then the second question, part of this question is, can enterprise users order development projects? So, so certainly, I mean, the, uh, I guess on the latter, last part of it, uh, the ordering, um, I mean, any, uh, you know, anything you can think of as a request, uh, form-based request can be made, uh, you know, publishable, or make it publishable via the, the portal is something you would uh, take the inputs from the user and submit as a new input request from a consumer, from a requester. Um, so that's certainly, you know, a, a, a common use case in here. Um, in terms of kind of tracking uh, software development lifecycle, uh, you know, either a release or um, or a sprint or whatever your methodology entails, certainly that information, there is a place in service now to do SDLC management um, and manage the releases, the stories, the, uh, the various sprints and activities. Um, so certainly that information could be shared with a consumer or a stakeholder via the portal um, status page would probably be the most logical place to share that information as a way to say, um, here are the uh, SDLC product development releases that I care about in their current state of activity, current state and or, or recent activities um, that I could consume as a, uh, you know, an interested party in those activities. Okay, great, thanks. And I do want to remind everyone when you send a question, please use the Q&A panel and send it to all panelists. If you send it just to Jeff or Don, they might not miss it. So all panelists, please, on the Q&A panel. Jeff, next question for you. What characteristics would you see being utilized to drive the presentation of information in the portal customer? Um, I mean, so one of the things I mentioned before was um, the goal uh, is that we should present things con that are contextually relevant to the target consumer. Um, so they don't have to kind of sift through the weeds and you know, dig through things that aren't relevant to them in order to find the, the things that they want to order and request or the information that's relevant to them. Um, I think the, the how this is accomplished is, is where things might likely vary. Um, you know, first you probably need to define or you might, you know, you may have different personas uh, as well as, you know, and I guess the second thing is defining kind of how you would classify a user into one of those personas. Um, an example being, you know, we've been working pretty recently with a lot of higher education customers, and, you know, it's, fair, it's pretty common to present different information to, say, students versus the faculty or staff kind of personas. Um, but we see oftentimes the challenge is taking that deeper into, say, a school, a campus, or kind of a subclassification of students. Um, so we find that it's very common to have the desire to profile users and target the knowledge, the items, or other portal content based off of these profiles. But we also find that there, there tends to be a lack of reliable user data to really drive this prescriptive presentation. Um, and so, you know, if we can't profile or prescribe content, another approach is, and I kind of hit on this a little bit, is to empower the customer with some personalization options uh, where they can kind of choose their preferences, set their favorites, set their filters, um, another thing is to do similar to what I did before, uh, or what I showed earlier, which is using their kind of activities or history uh, to, to influence what information is presented to them. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff, another one for you. The catalog you have presents a unified view of products or services to customers. Have you worked with any clients where the teams who worked together were siloed by function areas, for example, Windows and Linux, Linux, right? Linux server <laughs> OS. And if so, how much does a solution like the Metro style catalog add value? That's a good question. You want me to read it again, Jeff? Uh, yes. The catalog you have, the catalog you have presents a unified view of the products or services to customers. Have you worked with any clients where the teams who work together were siloed by function areas such as Windows and Linux Server OS? And if so, how much does a solution like the Metro Style catalog add value? I have a comment on that one. If you want me to start, Jeff. 
Yes, go ahead, Don. You were kind of, my phone was kind of breaking out a little bit, so I might have missed some of it. But go ahead, Don. Okay. So the uh, so this this is a classic this is a classic situation. IT is organized in silos, which are you know centers of competency, right? And that's not a it's a, that's a logical way to organize capability because it creates mentoring and apprenticeship and sharing, right? So it's a it's a perfectly logical way to do things. That said, that is not the service delivery point. Right, the service is what the customer requires. Right, and in most cases, to use this example, the service is not somebody wanting a Linux operating system. It's somebody wanting a new platform, right, or an upgraded platform. And it would it would be more than just the operating system. So, that little that provisioning service of Linux is a subservice that's part of a larger delivery motion that is customer centric, right. But it's still a service that gets delivered as part of that bigger motion. So it has to be managed that way as well by the team. And that kind of brings up the point I was making in the taxonomy, that the taxonomy is built for the customer from a labeling standpoint. You know, if I'm an IT, you know, we've got two different IT taxonomies, one for IT internal, let's call it, and one for customer facing. Well, they use different labels, right? And in some cases, the services are different as well. But that labeling is what the service the customer wants, and then the combination of things to generate it can be and usually comes from multiple IT. Right, so this is changing from silo to service. All that said, we're already delivering services. It's just in the hardest possible way we can, right? And we don't, as a team, have visibility into our quality execution end to end. Yeah, and I think you said it well, Don. I mean, I think yeah, certainly, um, you know, there is a product capability with the service now to be able to have multiple different portals for different functional, you know, silos, as you said, Linux versus Windows, et cetera. Though I think we, we think about it from a customer lens, they may not really understand that they need to go one place for one thing and one another place for another thing. Um, that it, if you think about it from a services that they want to consume and in a language they consume, li likely it's going to make sense to have you know, a single portal for them to come into. Now, how you manage that on the back end may differ based off of, uh, you know, organizations and silos and departments and areas of responsibility and so forth. Great, thanks. Um, I have a question and uh, I'm kind of chuckling only because it's a, I think it's a topic that we've talked about revisiting before and we've certainly done the webinar before and um, Don and I will ask you what is the difference between the request catalog and the service catalog. <laughs> and um, so kind of inside joke, we've talked about revisiting some of our older topics so uh, maybe we need to do that. Um, Don, I'll let you answer the question. So yeah, there is a there's a webinar specifically on that, which actually was the first one we ran in the webinar series, I think, back in September of last year. And the uh, the and partly this is this is axiomatic. The there the way we look at it, a request tends to be in in this parlance, and you can go into idle and dig into it. But a request is typically a single threaded kind of activity or or action, and it can be it may not be a service, it may be customer centric. It may be a one-time thing, like I would like a tablet, or I want to get uh, I want to get a printer. Requests tend to be linear and, and sort of rifle shotish. And from a service, a service is a broader view of something, and a service generally has service has a broader combinations of things from which requests can be made. And for example, in a service catalog, we have a service called SAP. And it's really not SAP, it's financials, right? But SAP is a big part of what that service is. So it becomes a it becomes a, a labeling question. And in that we have a system availability. We have the you know, we have to maintain certain uptime, there's a quality of service, there's security, there's a number of things that are delivered as part of that service. But you could also request access to accounts receivable, which is like a request off of that service. Right? So typically the request is, like I said, a single maybe a single threaded kind of individual activity and the service is more of a pervasive longer term combination of things and that's a layman's way of describing it we could we could go more wonky on it but i think that probably suffices for the moment okay great thanks um, just a reminder, I will be sending an email out no later than tomorrow with a link to the recording and to the slides i did receive some questions about that jeff another question for you is there a way for the service owner to manage and remediate negative feedback? 
I mean, certainly, as you saw on the portal, we, we highlight kind of the service owner, any of those kind of negative feedback they get. Um, though to date, we haven't really built any workflow into ServiceNow for kind of remediating or responding or kind of taking action on that feedback. Um, I will note that this is on our kind of to-do list that we're kind of optimistic about having folded into the solution in the next coming months. Um, you know, in the meantime, certainly that information on the dashboard is, is a, I think, a valuable vehicle to the service owner um, to see the feedback and act on either the positive or the negative uh, and work with the individuals and ultimately, you know, develop a plan of uh, either a service improvement or a service continuation kind of plan that, to continue to drive uh, the quality of that service forward. Yeah, thanks for asking that question because that's one of the requests that's near and dear to my heart on our roadmap. <laughs> Uh, another question for Jeff. For the guided help, can YouTube video, SharePoint, or forum content be presented to the user as an aid? Uh, yes, and I, and I would say this is certainly a growing requirement as, uh, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with more and more of the answers that our customers, you know, are looking for or asking questions in regards, you know, might reside in uh, knowledge repositories outside of ServiceNow or even outside of the organization. Um, you know, in, in the demo, I showed kind of knowledge articles that would help the customer kind of uh, work through access questions pertaining to Salesforce.com, and I think that would be you know a good example where you would likely want to tie in uh, YouTube videos on the on the subject along with uh, kind of you know Salesforce.com customer forum content um, that would aid the customer. You know, the challenge we oftentimes find is that finding the appropriate solution to kind of harvest all these various sources um, into one single weighted results list is, is not always the easiest thing to, to, to accomplish, um, mostly because there is a lot of information out there. Um, we do have some customers that are utilizing with some success uh, tools like Google Search Appliance, uh, Covio is another solution that we've, we've seen with some success as well as Right Answers. Um, as kind of a means of bringing these multiple information sources into a single search, uh, though I don't know that any of them are actually using them to reach out beyond their own walls to, to look at, you know, public internet content or community sites, anything like that. Great, thanks. Uh, Don, I think uh, this is probably for you. What are the three biggest mistakes organizations make in trying to create an Amazon-like experience? That's a, that's an easy answer, the, although it's hard to limit it to three. The, uh, let's see, probably the first biggest mistake is, you know, and, and a lot of these things are based on the nature of IT and its habits and its culture, but the first thing is that IT tries to do this in a big bang way rather than iteratively, and in our experience, that never really works very well because there's no learning process in play, and there's a lot to learn about customer-centric IT service delivery. And that, that usually an iterative thing. So when IT does it big bang, it usually is kind of one big bad outcome then. And we've seen this many, many times. Uh, secondly, uh, those of us in IT have an out of control sense of urgency in our DNA. You know, we've got to keep moving, we've got to be doing. And this usually results in cutting the customer out of the loop when we go through the design process and assuming that we know what the customer wants. And that, that is just not the case, right? Uh, but it takes more time to ask and to understand and seek to understand. It, it's, it's a little bit harder. Uh, thirdly, you know, the effort to build a durable end-to-end -end customer service experience is usually underestimated. And in any particular experience, it does take some time and energy. And IT often, you know, short sells that and ends up with a pretty storefront only, but a poor customer service experience end-to-end. -end. So those are, those are three that stand out. Great, thanks. And uh, also, Don, for building a service factory in ServiceNow, can you use the demand and portfolio modules? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, actually it's 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 absolutely essential to get a service factory process into the platform, because then the governance and the process compliance are baked in, and they arrive naturally with the flow of work, which is which is you know that's that's nirvana. That's what we want to have happen. You know, right now we are working on. Uh, a new product in this area, a complete end-to-end, -end, full lifecycle service factory solution built into the ServiceNow platform using demand and portfolio and hope to bring that to market before the end of the year. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
A quick response, someone asked me about our past webinars. If you go to evergreensys.com, that's evergreensys.com, and then along the top you'll see a tab that says resources. If you go there, you can sign up for future webinars and find recordings of all of our past webinars. Uh, I also had another question come in. Bear with me. I am uh, scrolling through here to try to uh, find it. Uh, let's see. Um, this question could probably be for both of you. What are some of the ways to make a service request process easier and provide a better experience for our customers? Well, the, I can tell you, I can take a stab at part of it first. The, uh, if you look at what we talked about today in the design principles, they're all customer experience based, right? And you're always trying to create a complete self-service experience for the customer that is enjoyable. You know, that's really what we're trying to achieve here. And, you know, not everything can be fully self-service, but the goal is to drive it as far as possible. And w when that's done, then that experience you know, and they, you know, it's all about that overall experience and making sure the customer feels the end to end it was quite enjoyable as a request process. So that's your high level goal. The five principles will help keep you in line any given time, right? Like you can say, hey, that's not simple enough. We want to be simple, but simple kind of fights with complete. If you think about it, in a dynamic way, it has to be simple and complete, right? So that's a you know that's an interesting that's an interesting paradox. They, 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 the, the two together interplaying improve both, right? Uh, last but not least, there's lots of great places you can always go to look and, and service reference. Go to Amazon if you're ever struggling, like what kind of customer experience are we building? Go to Amazon and be the customer, or go to Zappos and be the customer, right? And it, match, it allows you to snap your frame of rest, reference instantly and go, ah, that's right, this is what ex an excellent customer experience looks like because now I'm acting like the customer. And as simple as that sounds, it's hard to think like the customer when you're the provider. Great, and I think I've got all of them. Let me do one quick scroll here while I've got everyone. Um, and again, the email will go out no later than tomorrow with uh, the link to the recording and the slides. And I do think I got everyone's questions, so I want to thank everyone for your time today and for joining us. We will be announcing another topic most likely by Monday, so please do check the resources page of our website and stay tuned for an email from me no later than tomorrow with today's content. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.